Hello, my name is Dr. George Sparks, and I'll be speaking for Bible Interact today. The topic will be on the Tower of Babel. We're going to look at the Tower of Babel from the biblical perspective, but also we're going to look at archaeology and also some other theories about the word plays that we read in the Bible. Okay, so Hebrew translations of words and also the interchanging of different words in the epic event of the Tower of Babel. So let me begin. I got a lot of reading today, so open up your Bibles or just view the video and then later compare it to your biblical text. But follow the screen very, very carefully because we got a lot to learn today. And I'm sure you're going to find it extremely fascinating, so stay with me. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. So if you got your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. Your Bible probably will be reading a little bit differently than my text. But as it is, let's go ahead and start. Cush had a son named Nimrod, who became the world's first great conqueror, according to the biblical text. By the Lord's help, he was a great hunter. And this is why people say, may the Lord make you a great hunter as Nimrod. At first, his kingdom included Babylon, or we just say Babel, such as Erech and Akkad. All three of them, Babel, Erech, Akkad, all three in Babylonia, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8. At first, the people of the whole world had only one language and used the same words. As they wandered about in the east, they came to the plain of Babylonia, the land of Shinar, and settled there. They said to one another, come on, let's make bricks and bake them very hard. So they had bricks to build and they had uh, tar to hold them together. They said, now let's build a city in, and with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the whole earth. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which they had built. And he said, Now then, these are all one people, and they speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they are going to do. Soon they will be able to do anything, anything they want. Let's go down and mix up their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. Genesis eleven seven, 7. The city was called Babylon, because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people, and from there he scattered them all over the earth. The next slide that I'm going to show you is according to uh, the dating of the Bible by an individual whose name is Bishop Usher. These dates used to be very popular, but because of modern-day archaeology and technologies, they are widely disputed. But to the general populace, to the general population, and in many Bibles, these dates are still taken as very literal. Now, once again, because of our academic achievements and also our achievements in archaeology, these are widely disputed. For instance, the date of the flood, 2348. We know now that the pyramids of Egypt were constructed in around 2500 BC. So you can see how this could be very problematic. It dates the Tower of Babel to around 2242, and also the founding of Babel around 2235. All right. So with these dates, just have in mind that through time and technology, things do change. Things do change. We are more advanced now, so we're going to get a, a look at archaeology. Cuneiform tablets. These date to around 3,000 BCE, or 5,000 years ago. These are the very early stages of cuneiform tablets. Cuneiform means, cuneiform means wedge form. So wedged form tablets. Now, these were made out of mud brick. And as we read in Genesis, their cities were made out of mud brick. So why not their little tablets as well? What would be more common than to write on dried mud brick, okay, or dried pieces of clay? So if you look on the left or your right-hand side, you'll see tablets with segments designed within it, little block groups, 
And here we have little circles and squares and lines, very early forms of a cuneiform tablet. On the other side, we have a circular tablet. And if you look very, very carefully, the lines start, uh, the horizontal lines start uh, wider on one side and they get narrower towards the other. Okay, this is a teaching tablet. So a scribe has given a lesson to some young children and they have uh, designed this tablet and drew the lines themselves and that's why it's crooked. These students are beginning to learn how to, just like in second grade, how to stay in the lines, but first they have to learn how to draw, draw their lines. This is a little chart representing the uh, evolution, if you, will, if you will, of cuneiform. Look at number one, for instance, the sun symbol, all right? Or this is the one I like, the symbol for God and heaven. It looks like a little starburst. So remember that symbol because we're going to try to find that on other tablets that I'm going to show you. The sun symbol. The symbol of the man. It almost looks like a little mummy laid down horizontally. Or the symbol of the ox, the fish. The ox is a triangle with two lines representing the horns. An early Eastern Akkadian cylinder seal with different gods being represented. How do we know different gods are represented? Well, first of all, you can see the seal. And the seal was rolled on the clay to represent the ownership of that tablet or who it is from. Okay, so if you look very carefully, as the imprint of the seal was left on this little bit of clay, if you will, it looks like more like silly putty, you can see those little starbursts, and two of them. So we know just by in less than five minutes, this tablet is representing two deities, right? Okay, let's take a look at some of those two tablets that I just showed you. Now let's look at them again. I have some little arrows pointing out some figures for you. Okay, on the square tablet, you notice the first arrow, you see a triangular figure, all right? This is the symbol, if you look very carefully, of the ox. Right below it, another red arrow pointing down to the starburst, a god. And if we go to the other side, you'll see the little symbol, it looks like a man's head, if you look very carefully. So it means a human or a man. When you see those little half moon imprints, Look like they've been pressed in the clay. That's their designated way of counting. So they're counting cattle or crop as probably being blessed by the gods. And it also has some human being or man being represented in this, in this particular tablet. So this more than likely is just stating that uh, a blessing to the crops and cattle for their harvest. And they give in a, a listing of how much crops or how much cattle they have. This is probably what's going on. Something very similar to that. Okay? The next tablet, if you look, you can see the lines are they're very crooked. I pointed it out. How the lines start thick on one side, narrow on the other. This is cuneiform. A very early form of writing, if we're going to look at those people that are mentioned or being um, referred to in the Tower, Tower of Babel, because we can date it at least to around... 2500 BC, and it's thereabouts, thereabouts, except that's what the text seems to be representing, okay? The word tower in Hebrew actually means the word migdal. It's tra translated to a high place, a tower or a pulpit. So it's not just a tower being built to heaven. It seems like what they're building is a pulpit, and what do you do from a pulpit, even in church? It's where your, your sermon's going to be represented. There. You're going to have the priest, the pastor, at the pulpit. They're building something of a religious significance for the people of that community. Okay? Here we have an image of an artist's design of a tower that has been discovered in the Middle East, or the Near East, Middle East, excuse me. Also, another representation, but this is a picture of a ziggurat, a mud brick stepped tower. And here we have our American soldiers investigating this very ancient step tower, which we know in archaeology is referred to as ziggurat. So here we know through archaeology and the study of ancient languages, we know that they're probably writing in some form of Sumerian, Akkadian, cuneiform. And also, what does this tower look like? Well, we're looking at it as possibly a ziggurat. What's it going to be used for? Religious purpose. Okay? 
the etymology in most English-speaking countries. We're going to look at this word Nimrod. We're going to break down the text a little bit, and I know this is going to be a lot of fun. All right? In most English-speaking countries, Nimrod is used to denote a hunter or a warrior because the biblical Nimrod is described as a mighty hunter. In American English, however, the term has assumed a derogatory meaning, probably because of a Bugs Bunny cartoon, remember the cartoons, reference to Elmer Fudd as a poor little Nimrod. While this was most likely using the term, terms hunter sense, it contributes to the development of a sense of one who was easily confounded. All right. So when the term Nimrod, usually we say it in America, it doesn't mean a mighty hunter at all. It, does, it means somebody that is kind of like a goof off who is confounded. Okay, we're going to look at the word as it is mentioned in the Bible, the word speech. They were given one speech or language. In Hebrew, it is debar. And it's translated to be a question, a reason, a purpose, or a counsel. So we know that the structure was built for religious purposes. It's called a ziggurat. We know that the speech could be used for a question, a reason, a purpose, or a counsel. Sounds like it could be used in, for religious purposes as well. But with the idea of speech, I can say speech being we all have one speech. That could be saying that we all speak English, but it also could be interpreted as saying we all have one frame of mind. All right, We could have different languages but still have the same frame of mind. Now, how is that? Well, I could say that a Lutheran in Germany who speaks German would probably have the same religious traditions as a Lutheran who speaks English in America. In that sense, religious sense, they speak the same language. All right? Now, some scholars have suggested that what we are really reading was the first big church split. The people no longer agree with who is God or God's and what to believe as, sense, as some form of theology. Maybe that's the reason why they split. God confounded their language. They no longer agree with one another. Now let's look at our own American, our American traditions. As Americans, we should, we should probably consider this theory. The Bible that the pilgrims brought with them was not the King James Bible. A lot of us, were, we believe that the King James Bible, that's what we're taught, is what the pilgrims brought with them. It wasn't. It was actually the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible was our really first study Bible with chapters and side notes, but was very anti-Catholic, anti-Pope, or I could say anti-Catholicism. Why? Because Early Americans settled, settled and stepped on Plymouth Rock because of a difference of religious belief. We no longer had the same language. We no longer had the same speech. And it became such a, you could say, of an edge that they left the country and settled in America. Okay? So they fled Europe because of religious persecution. Now let's look at the word Nimrod. All right? The, the word Nimrod. So we're looking at ideas of what went on and what the Bible means by the Tower of Babel and those events. But what does the word Nimrod mean? All right, so a play on words. We saw archaeology, we saw text, writing. Let's look at wordplay. The Hebrew Bible is just full and rich in wordplay. All right, but you got to take your time. It's more than just a biblical study of reading chapters and verses and saying, okay, I read the Bible because I read it from the first page to the last. When we look at the words, those themselves, when we're very careful, have meaning. We're going to look at the word Nimrod. According to the researcher David Roll, who actually, actually is an Egyptologist, the original story of the Tower of Babel may describe the last phase of the building of the great temple for the god Inki at Eridu, biblical Babel, which was begun in this Uruk period. Now, let's say, what the world just happened? All you got to do is think about this. In this one text, this word scramble right here, all you have to remember, the biblical text about the Tower of Babel probably, probably according to David Roll, refers to the last phase of the building of a great temple. That makes sense, because a ziggurat was religious. 
built for religious purposes, to reach unto heaven. The next thing we're going to look at is an artifact found in archaeology. It's called the Mesopotamian King's List. And this Mesopotamian King's List gives the dates in which supposable kings reigned in the Mesopotamian kingdoms. Now, the listing of these names, we're going to look at one that possibly refers to Nimrod. But something that's very, very interesting in this text, this Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian king list, the kings lived for thousands of years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years. But early in Genesis, those people, um, pre-diluvian, if you will, um, they lived for a long time as well. In reference probably to their earlier heritage from Mesopotamia, because that's where Abraham was from. People, it's not necessarily that they lived a long time. It could be. Some scholars suggest that saying that a king lived for 20,000 years doesn't mean he necessarily lived for 20,000 years. But he ruled through the authority of the gods and the goddesses that were worshipped in his country. All right? So what he did as a king was equivalent to what a common person would do in 20,000 years. That's how great the king was. For you and me, it take 20,000 years. But understand, we're going to look at, number one, a name that was mentioned in the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian king's list on this cuneiform, uh, not necessarily a tablet, but a cylinder. Roll believes that the biblical king Nimrod, son of Cush, was in fact king Enmerkar, in Merkar. He continues, Cush, biblical son of Ham, grandson of Noah, fathered Nimrod, who was the first potentate on earth. Hence the saying, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter in the eyes of Yahweh. But Nimrod himself has always eluded identification, well, at least until now. The trick was to realize that the element K-A-R in in Merkar was the Sumerian word for hunter. Thus the name consists of a nomen plus an epithet, Nimr, the hunter. This was precisely the epithet in Genesis used to describe Nimrod. The second step, or the next step, was very straightforward. Ancient Hebrew was originally written without vowels. No A, E, I, or U's, okay? No vowels. As in the Dead Sea Scrolls, vowels indicators were only added in the Masoretic manuscripts from the 5th century A.D. onwards. So in early copies of Genesis, the name Nimrod would simply have been written N-M-R-D. The name Nimr would also have been transcribed into a Hebrew as N-M-R, identical to Nimrod, but for the last D. The Bible is well known for its play on words. Hebrew writers often, often translated foreign names into familiar Hebrew words, which they felt had appropriate, appropriate meaning. In this case, they changed Sumerian NMR to Hebrew NMRD because of no vowels, because the latter had the meaning rebel, rebel in Hebrew, a perfect description for the king who defied God by building a tower to heaven. So that's a pretty good study of just a text that we started off. Oh, the Tower of Babel. We've all read about the Tower of Babel. These people come together with one mind and one accord, and they seem to be very smug, and they're building this tower and it's going to reach unto heaven as if they're going to go through the layers of the atmosphere, but that's impossible. You're going to go so high and run out of oxygen. Number one, the higher you get, the smaller the tower has to become because you have to have a large enough base to support the height and the weight of the tower itself. That they might have one language alone, and then where did all these languages come from? Maybe the Bible is indicating that the language is more not a language of by mouth, but a language of theology, that they all agreed in worshiping, worshiping the same gods and goddesses of which they came together to build this large tower. So God, when he came down, it wasn't that they were building a large tower. It was what the tower 
represented that they were worshiping different gods and goddesses. So it comes down to confound their language. So they no longer agree. And since they no longer agree, then why finish building the structure? So they disperse. Maybe this is what we're reading in the text. Also, the name Nimrod is a very interesting case by David Roll. I think it's a very interesting way in which we can understand the Hebrew play in words represented in the Bible. It's an ancient text. It's 2,000 years old or older, and we bring it into our Western culture with our Greek-oriented minds, and we read it as if it needs to be read very literal, and we miss some of the most interesting points that are referred to, referred to and by the text. So the next time you read a story such as, that you're just taking for granted, maybe the first one, such as Adam and Eve in the garden, or... Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babel, Samson and Delilah, all these Hebrew narratives in the biblical text, if we took a deeper, a deeper look at the text, took our time and studied it, what we would find out would be just amazing. I, th I hope that you had a very interesting time, a very <laughs> appreciative time in and uh, going through the Tower of Babel with me. We're going to take a look at some artifacts now in the room of a thousand artifacts. So join me over in the next room. Once again, my name is Dr. George Sparks, and we're going to take, us, uh, take a look at some artifacts from the biblical time period, which we call the Early Bronze Age. The Early Bronze Age, I'm going to give you some general, uh, general time period. to start around 3000 B.C., so we call it Early Bronze Age 1, and then we get to around 2700 B.C., and then they'll say Early Bronze Age 2. And then as we get uh, to around 23, we used to call it MB3, I believe, but now it's called Intermediate Middle, Middle Bronze Age, I believe, the interme Intermediate Period. I believe, to the best of my knowledge, what we're looking at here, of course, is Early Bronze Age vessels. The first clue to looking at an early vessel is that how well fired is, is the vessel? How well fired was it in the kiln? Did they even have a kiln? Or we look at the vessel itself, and I'm looking at the inside of the vessel for striations where it would have been spun on the potter's wheel. If I don't see any striations in the clay, the terracotta, then possibly it was it dates before the potter's wheel. So if we have pottery that doesn't sound like it's been cooked in a kiln. Maybe it's been sun-dried. They haven't invented kilns yet. And no striations in the vessel, then possibly they don't have the potter's wheel. Two indications that we're looking, because the potter's wheel was invented pretty much around 2000 BC. Pottery that was made before 2000 BC. We're looking at pottery that's over 5,000 years old. That's pretty amazing. Pottery that probably predates, predates the pyramids of Egypt. Now, when you think about that in your mind, that's, that's almost baffling. That I can actually reach out and touch a vessel that's older than the pyramids of Egypt. These were probably located in a, a cemetery on the east side of the Dead Sea, known as a territory called Babi Dra. More than likely, I'm not sure, but these look like vessels that were from that particular time period in which that cemetery was being used. So today it'd be in the country of Jordan. All right? So this looks more like a, what we call an amphoriscos. You could say an amphora, but much, much smaller. So we never say mini amphora in archaeology. We call it, we got to have a technical name, you know, to justify the degree. Possibly an amphoriscos. It's got two little handles, probably two little handles so you could like hang it probably from some kind of a, a beam or a structure in your house, all right? And this keeps it from just laying on the ground and having animals or little critters like ants get inside of it. It has a little spout to it, but no striations. What could have it held? That's always interesting, isn't it? What could have this had inside it? Oils, perfumes, water? But it was important enough to keep off the ground. 
maybe juices. It has a little pattern on it. It has what we call the coloration of the pottery being dyed or you want to stain is called a slip. It looks like it has a light slip on the outside of it and has a red or light brown net painted design. We call it a net painted design. It's got a, not really a base at all. Maybe we just want to call this a flat base. It's not a disc base. It's a flat base. They quit doing flat base, bases around, let's say, the time of the Middle Bronze Age. It starts to switch, definitely during the Iron Age. Uh, the uh, disc bases look like a little tray that you would sit, um, in, you could say, a cup on. It's a little tray. In other words, if I just sit this on the ground and there's a rock there, it immediately affects the vessel. But if I have a little circle, a little edge of clay around it, looks like a little disc around it, it sits on that disc instead of on the pottery itself. So it doesn't crack the vessel. And what side of it and what's inside leaks out, all right? So ampharisco's. This looks like a jug, but this one's really cool. It's what we call lead-shaped handles. They put the handles on there and they pretty much take a stick, supposedly, and they push little indentations into the little handles. So they're called lead-shaped handles. Way to grab the vessel. It's got also some kind of line group design outside the vessel right here, imprinted with inside the vessel for decoration. But it's more than a storing vessel, it has a little spout. Now it looks like the spout has been kind of like refashioned more modern times, but it, it is what it is. Once again, the flat base, very, very common in the early Bronze Age. So the Tower of Babel, archaeology, written text, and also vessels. Thank you very much for your time.